Okay, good morning everybody. Thank you for joining a Layer 7 webinar here on five ways to get top mobile app developers talent to your open APIs. Uh, if anyone has any issues uh, joining into the audio or the WebEx, uh, please use the chat window uh, and send it to the hosts and uh, we'll be happy to help you figure it out. Um, we are trying to do some video here as well this morning, so uh, bear with us. Everything should work fine. Uh, but hopefully, if, if there's any issues, you'll just let us know, and we'll make sure to get that resolved for you right away. Just to give some housekeeping items here to start out, uh, again, please, if you have any questions, uh, send them into the chat window and send them to the hosts. Uh, we will have a question and answer session at the end of the webinar, so we'll address all your questions then and make sure to answer them all. Uh, the hashtag for today's event is hash L7 webinar. Or if you want to send any tweets, we'd be glad to hear from you. Uh, we'd love any, any tweets that you want to send us, and we'll try and respond to them as quickly as possible. Uh, just to let you know, for today's webinar, um, the uh, presenters involved, uh, if you'd like to follow us on Twitter, uh, we have the Twitter account Layer7 for Layer7 Technologies. Uh, also with us is a uh, Master of Hackathons from AT&T, uh, who can be followed with at ATT Developer. Uh, my personal Twitter is Intellex, and the personal Twitter for Alex Dawn is Alex underscore Dawn. Also here we provide the social media links uh, in case you'd like to follow us on the other networks, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, or our blogs. Uh, just to quickly give some introductions here. The presenters for today's webinar are myself, Alex Gaber, and Alex Dawn. Uh, is the master of hackathons at AT&T. We're very excited to have him join us, and <clears throat> very, very privileged. Uh, so we're really excited to have Alex on today. Uh, he will be uh, focusing on the hackathon aspect of driving mobile app talent to your APIs. Uh, so we'll be ha uh, hearing from him shortly here uh, once he's joined in. So to begin this talk, uh, I just kind of want to give a webinar overview. Uh, opening, a, opening up APIs to developers uh, enables innovation. Uh, we often talk about the long tail, partners, uh, internal innovation. Open APIs drive all of those, whether it's during hackathon internally for building mobile apps or internal enterprise applications, which many of our Air 7 customers have, uh, or whether it's opening up APIs to uh, the greater developer community uh, and putting them out to the public and getting developers to sign on with, for your APIs. Uh, these all directly result in app development and apps built, being built and innovative and creative solutions uh, built around your APIs. And a lot of times these types of innovations can occur with minimal investment from the side of the, in the innovation, them the company themselves. Uh, so these are just kind of topics we want to cover today. Uh, and then what we're going to talk about is how to drive a really a robust API pr program to build an ecosystem of developers uh, around your APIs, giving them what they need to build the best possible apps, the tools, resources, and, and assistance, so you get those kinds of innovations built around your APIs and get that community growing, which will then flourish and grow within itself. So the f five different uh, areas that we'll be talking about today are first, launching the developer portal. How do you bring developers into your APIs, how to give them access, and again, this can be an internal developer portal, it can be just for private partners, and of course it can be open to the world, developer.yourcompany.com. Uh, secondly, we'll be talking about how to get developers adoption of those APIs through interactive documentation, forums, and so forth. Well, it looks like Alex, I just want to make sure, uh, Alex Donis, uh, you join us now, I think I can hear you on the line. Uh, Alex, welcome. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Pleasure to be here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, great to hear you. So, Alex, I'll, I'll mute, mute you for now, um, and then it okay. uh, looks like you have to mute, mute yourself because you're now a presenter. So, we will have uh, Alex be uh, presenting here in just a few minutes on, on the hackathon aspect of all this. Okay. So, back to the agenda here. Uh, then we'll be talking about building a brand around your API, treating your API as a product. Uh, how to really build that brand and, and make that API stand out from everything else you're doing. And then we'll be talking about hackathons. That's where Alex Don will step in, our guest speaker. Again, very excited to have him here. And then last, we'll also be talking about the on the hackathon, other things that companies are doing uh, as, as far as online developer challenges and contests to, to, to drive that kind of mobile app innovation. 
So first here is launching an easy to use developer portal. So an API por portal is often developer.yourcompany.com. Here we have some examples like developer.att.com, which is where Alex Don works and what he works on there. Developer.mastercard.com, developer.alfresco.com, the lottery developer network.com, where they simply mean their API is a whole uh, standalone product um, separate from their main brand by a company called GTech. So these are just some screenshots here to show you some portals. <laughs> and what we're going to do is kind of go through some best practices here for how to make these developer portals as developer friendly as possible. Often we hear about things like dev UX, the developer user experience, and how to make that as seamless and frictionless as possible. So we are trying to, we're going to do some video here. Um, want to make sure that uh, everyone can see this. And if you can't see it, uh, please chat into the window and let us know. And also, uh, we were having some issues with the audio. If you do see, if you do have additional audio, uh, popping up for this video. Um, in the bottom right corner where the video is playing, uh, you should be able to turn off the additional audio that's coming through uh, from it. So right here I'm looking at the developer.alfresco.com API portal. Uh, this is a portal run by Layer 7 Technologies uh, Technology. Uh, it's just one example of a really well-built portal here. So here what I want to do is register as a developer. So you can see here I, I click register, and we make this process as seamless, quick, and frictionless as possible. So super easy. So in this case, the simplest thing needed is just first name, last name, email, password. Here's the developer now. I can review all the terms of service. Developers always want to know, what am I getting myself into? If I build this API into my platform, into my mobile app, what am I going to owe this company? So here I can now say I accept the terms and conditions. Everything looks good. For now, I just want to get in there. I want to start playing with those APIs. So I hit register now. In this case, my account was created. That's all I need to do, and I'm in. I've got my, my portal access. So this is just the quickest and easiest way to get developers access to your APIs and let them start playing with it. Now, as, a, as an API provider, you may often want to get additional info and say, hey, are they building for iOS or Android? What, what, are, what kind of uh, APIs do they want to consume, and, and where are those APIs being consumed? So in this case here, we'll register as a developer again, we go through that same quick process here, uh, email, uh, and first name, last name, password put in, review the terms of service, and I'm going to go ahead and accept those terms of service. And in this case, though, as a developer, I say, well, okay, I want to make sure I get my API key right away. I want to start building my app. So I can now go to the next step and put in my application name. And what this does is quickly give that developer an API key so they can instantly start developing. So here I'm an Android developer. I'm going to actually go build on Android, describe my app here, and put that in. And so now the API publisher, in this case Alfresco, will know exactly what app I'm building and what I'm going to do. And here's the APIs that are being offered. And you can see they're nicely mouses over. It lets you know, okay, this API gives you access to certain features. So I click on that. I accept the terms and conditions of that specific API. And I can go ahead and, and now register for that API. And it's going to provision me out with an API key just like that. So this is just another step here along the process of making it easy to get that top talent onto your APIs and using them right away. So the next step here is once I've got access to those APIs, I can, I've now logged into the portal. And you can see here as a developer, I've got things that will be useful to me. So I can go and I can see the applications that I registered. So here I just registered that app. I can see the details. And I can go click on the information and find out what access am I getting here? What API access is this giving me? Just again, because you need to be very upfront and transparent with those developers to get them to be interested in using your APIs. So this just goes to show just a very quick, easy process for onboarding those developers and how having a good developer portal is key to that first step of getting developers there. Now the next step we'll go through here is offering interactive documentation and forums. As we just saw, I was able to register for the, the APIs, get access to them, get my keys, but how am I going to understand how those APIs work so I can start integrating them into my mobile apps? So interactive documentation, uh, as well as forums, helps uh, get the developers educated about your APIs, gets them excited about it, makes it look like the APIs are easy to use, uh, and, and gets them using them right away. Another thing we also often talk about is code samples for multiple languages, whether it's Objective-C for iOS, Java for Android, HTML5 or JavaScript for PhoneGap and or other mobile platforms. Uh, we find it really important to provide those simple code samples 
to developers uh, and the different mobile platforms that you're targeting uh, to be built for. Uh, this is often done through an API Explorer, and then even further, one step uh, we go beyond that is an API Explorer that auto-generates code to help the developers simply copy-paste that code right out of your API portal into their mobile app uh, coding environment, whether it's Xcode or Eclipse, and, and build that into their app. So here's an example. Uh, I just want to show you some really well-made documentation here. And again, we're using Alfresco as an example. It's a public API. So I just went and got all their information from there. Uh, here's the first step. They just provide a very nice, easy-to-read documentation file here. So I'm just scrolling through it. Here's a developer. I can quickly understand the most important things to me as a mobile app developer. How am I going to get these things to work? How am I going to set up OAuth for the users that are going to be able to need to log into the Alfresco backend system? How those access tokens work? How will I get a refresh token uh, so that the user doesn't have a timeout and they don't have to keep logging back in? All these things are very important for the mobile app developer as they're building your, these apps, and you need to be very upfront and clear to them how these things work. And they're showing the, the CRUD, uh, create, read, update, and delete. How do I update records? Uh, how do I read direct records from the, the resources available uh, on the Alfresco backend? And how do I integrate all that code into my app? So here, what we've done is show, it's showing as a JSON payload and makes it very quick, simple, and easy for that developer to understand how to get that code going in their site. Another API console concept here that's often uh, talked about that's very important here is, is providing those code samples. So here, this is an API Explorer. This is just a screenshot, uh, no video to show here. But uh, if you can see here, I have one API. I have a resource that I'm accessing. And then I can see the query. So I'm doing a get request uh, here just for a simple Vancouver City request. And I want to see some code samples for how to integrate that request back into my apps. So often you probably are looking at JavaScript here for a phone gap HTML5 app. A curl will be more for a website. Uh, but just providing these code samples right out of the API console will drastically reduce the, the time that it takes a developer to get going with your APIs and get them integrated into your apps. Uh, and this is also one other interesting company I just want to point out here that's kind of doing this right now is apiary.io. Uh, they basically let you post all your, your APIs onto GitHub. GitHub, and then they generate those code samples directly for you. Uh, so that it'll make them really easy to get those code samples out. Uh, and that's the kind of thing I just showed you in the previous screen. Uh, but APR, I want to mention, is one company that's just laser focused on delivering this language specific code samples via console, automatic documentation of your APIs, and into code for developers uh, to make them get them into their mobile apps as quickly as possible. Uh, another con console here I just want to quickly show you is one called Swagger. Uh, these are just other options and other ways and other approaches to getting uh, your, your API documented and interactive to developers, uh, especially on mobile. Uh, this is incredibly important here to show that and how to do it. So there I just able to say, okay, I want to get requests for a username and what methods are available to me? What, what data can I get back when I make that request into that API? Uh, so this is another type of explorer. And then here's just another one here uh, made by Neil Mansilla. It's a really, really nice one called IO Docs. This one here is just showing here I want to do a GET request uh, of contract available on the federal um, website here. And it's similar to Swagger, just a different approach. Uh, this is also open source, available on GitHub to download. Uh, it's called IO Docs. And it's really nice here. You can see all the different methods uh, and parameters available within an API and quickly test it. So here I'm actually going to just put one in for the IRS and try it. And here you have to wait a second here, and we'll see because it's actually real. It was recorded as a real, real API request there. And there we go. There's my response headers as a JSON response. Uh, I can see the API call. And I can see the full response body of that of that JSON payload. So I can see all the different IRS contracts there. Uh, but again, as far as building these APIs into your mobile apps, this is extremely useful to provide this to those developers. So they can quickly get access. There's the actual API call that went through. And again, it's showing that very easily uh, to the developers and makes it easy for them to do it. So thanks, Neil, uh, for putting together a great product there. So next, we want to talk about building a brand around your API. How do you 
uh, really make this brand stand out from the rest of your business because the API essentially becomes a whole separate product and, and something that is often a developer program at big companies like AT&T where, where Alex Don works. It's a whole really division within the company of the developer program. They treat it as a really almost a separate product and a separate team and uh, it's, it's a whole different focus for the company in a way um, that fits into their overall strategy of course. Um, so, so how do you do that? So you really want to promote a brand around your API, whether it's uh, mobile app development uh, around your API and, and how that API works. Uh, but you want to look at your API as like a separate product uh, and really market it as such. Uh, market it as a real, it's, its own business entity. Give the API owner its, their own business um, business P&L in a way of, of what that API is going to do. So approach it like a product. Um, understand that what engages the normal customers for your company will not may may or may not be ap appropriate for the developer audience, especially the mobile app developers. Uh, and one one great thing to do is analyze companies that are exclusively API businesses, ones like Twilio, Stripe, Singly. Um, there's we've seen a lot of more large companies launch these APIs as separate product lines as well. There's some great examples out there, including Mastercard, uh, AT&T, uh, and several others out there. But really treat it as a separate business and study how these other smaller startups in, in uh, Silicon Valley have done it and how they're approaching it. And really invest in your API. Often it takes, I hear about through a lot of customers of layer sevens, uh, they're, they're say, well, what's, what's our profit going to be from year one? And often that's a tough question to answer because the API is a long-term strategy. It's really building your business, making your, your API sticky within mobile apps isn't just going to be a simple thing. Often we hear the term mashups where a mobile app is pulling APIs from multiple different providers. If you're a content provider, if you're financial services, you may be pull, you're the apps that may be built on your APIs will probably be consuming APIs from many different sources. So you have to look at it that way and understand that this is making sure that your, your API, your content, your business is involved in these mobile apps and it's not being left behind. Uh, so it's really important to invest in these APIs accordingly. Uh, and then one other thing we'll talk about is building the brand around your API and treating your API like a product. So we also, you know, treat, how do you sell a product? And often we hear about channel distribution, building the sales organization. And it's not that different with the APIs. Uh, you have to really look at how do we get our API into the cr proper developer channels for mobile apps to get our APIs consumed and used by those developers and get them out there. So starting the simplest way, you need to get the sample code uh, built for the standard SDKs out there. So Xcode is the Apple developer environment. Uh, it's how you build iOS apps for, an, for iPhone and iPad. All the code is written in Objective-C there. So it's really important to provide those sample codes that will let a developer just drag and drop that code into Xcode and have, a frame, have the, the SDK for your API right there in their development environment. Uh, on Android, the development environment is Eclipse, typically. Uh, it's the main one, so when Google supports, although it could be done in other IDEs. Uh, and that's done in Java code. And so again, providing those uh, sample code plugins for Eclipse can be very useful. Eclipse even has their own marketplace. And you could generate your own marketplace plugins uh, for Eclipse and have them easily just brought into uh, the development environment there for Android. Also, we're seeing more and more traction really for HTML5, um, but when you hear HTML5 native mobile apps, most of the time people are really talking about PhoneGap. Uh, PhoneGap is a product that was built uh, by a company called Natobi out of Vancouver, and it was purchased by Adobe just about 13 months ago, a year and a month ago. Uh, Adobe brought, bought it, made it open source, and now it's called Cordova. So if you hear that name, same thing. Every, all the code there for API integration will be done with JavaScript. So it's very important to support that community as well uh, as we look at the millions of web developers making that transition down to mobile app development. A lot of them are going the path of PhoneGap because it's a, it's a world they understand. Uh, it's more of the model view controller type uh, framework that makes sense to them. So it's really becoming more and more important to support that, providing the JavaScript uh, sample code as well. And then as we look at other platforms out there, JavaScript's probably going to be the easiest one to do uh, and approach those as well. Um, but that's another thing that we help and talk to our customers about is what, what platforms you want to target. Um, although we, you know, talk about the demise of, of BlackBerry and RIM in certain countries in the world, they're still very popular and very successful. Uh, we can't discount Microsoft. And of course, there's going to be other mobile platforms that will come out in the future. And often, though, JavaScript's really the path, though, 
uh, that's going to get you into those platforms fairly easily and at a low cost. So here I want to use an example that I thought was really well done, um, where we're talking about you know getting that plugin out there, treating your API like a brand, getting your, your brand out there in different marketplaces where you can distribute it. So here at and um, when we'll have Alex Don may address this as well, uh, they built a plugin for AppCelerator. So they have at and has a bunch of different APIs, uh, and if you're a developer using AppCelerator now, as you can see here, it's just free, download now. So as an AppCelerator developer, I'm using their, their platform, they have a tool called Titanium, and I want to use at and APIs, I don't have to go figure out the code anymore. There's a plugin built and ready to go. So at and got themselves in that marketplace. If you notice here as well, we see product market, at and APIs, shop. So it's really, this is a product within the AppCelerator marketplace. And this is how at and has been treating their, their API and their, their, their uh, API portal like a brand. And they want to get it out there. They want the proper channel distribution. They want to get to those developers. Uh, and this is a great way to do that. Now, there's other, many other mobile platforms out there, and I want to show you another one here um, that, that's done this really well. Uh, it's called Tigzy, uh, and I'm going to show just an example here. They have many different plugins. They have the plugins for API, uh, AT&T's APIs here, uh, but just a really simple level here, I want to show what they've done, and obviously you, you can get many more plugins for it. Uh, we'll just show you this one today. So here I'm building a mobile app. This is their mobile app builder interface here. And I can say, let me see what, Twilio, what Tigzy plugins there are. There's SendGrid. I want to integrate SendGrid into my app. And just like that, it creates a new screen for me, pre-built with that entire SendGrid API structure all done for me. So I don't have to, as a developer, all I really need to do now is go into my SendGrid settings there that the tool auto-created for me, put in my username, my key, my API key, and I can check my, my uh, API methods, the request fields, the response payload. Just like that, though, the API is right away integrated into my mobile app. And the mobile app developer here had very little work. So in just less than 30 seconds, effectively, I've gotten a SendGrid API built in my mobile app, mobile app. I can fire off emails out of my mobile app just like that using SendGrid's email API. Um, so AT&T's got their APIs in here as well. Um, many other companies are getting their APIs into this tool. And again, there's many different tools out there. Tigzy, the Accelerator, just two of the, the pro more prominent ones out there. Uh, there's other ones like AppMobi, Trigger.io, and of course, even just PhoneGap at its most basic level are just other frameworks to build mobile apps. But as you can see here, the easier you make it for your API to be brought into that mobile app developer environment, the, the IDE, uh, the more easily your API will be adopted by those mobile app developers and integrated into the mobile apps they're building. So the next part here, uh, and again, we're very, very excited today to be um, bringing in Alex Don from AT&T, is talking about sponsoring hackathons and, and how those work. Uh, and hackathons, hackathons really represent a great, great first step to engaging developers, treating the hackathons as a test bed for your APIs. Uh, so, without further ado here, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Mr. Alex Don. Alex, uh, are you on the line there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you perfectly. So, Alex, so, uh, go ahead and uh, get started here. Maybe introduce yourself and uh, talk about what you've done with at and Yeah. So, uh, my name is Alex Don with the at t Developer Program out of uh, Redwood, Washington. and um, you can find us online at developer.att.com uh, and all of our APIs and uh, uh, you know supporting documentation as well as our other programs are online there. Yeah, um, and if you have any questions, you can reach out to me at um, Twitter at Alex underscore Don. Um, and then also the the other uh, we can also for support uh, at att developer uh, is our other is our main support Twitter handle. All right, so um, what you're seeing here is a screenshot of our mobile app hackathon.com website. And this is essentially the program that I created uh, about a year and a half ago to help promote our AT&T APIs. We knew that going forward, uh, as we uh, started coming out with more APIs, you know, we started out with SMS, MMS, uh, some of the uh, simpler uh, telephony-related APIs. Um, that we needed a user base that we could tap into at any point in time. Um, and so that's why hackathons, you know, hackathons, 
really are where the rubber meets the road when it comes to, you know, what Alex Gaber had spoke about earlier about, you know, portal, having an easy to navigate portal, detailed documentation, and um, most importantly, working code samples. Um, you know, these three items really, like, whether you've done a good job really comes to life, uh, you know, very quickly at a hackathon because you'll find out <laughs> from uh, how many complaints there are, right? And so if the users, if the developers at a hackathon can't find documentation, documentation is confusing, um, they, they'll, they'll, they'll tell you right away. Um, and so, you know, but that's also the great part about the hackathon is that it's live instantaneous feedback uh, from people who are interested in your API. Um, and there's no better or faster way to, to, to really drive engagement. Um, you know, so what you're seeing here is an example of uh, our hackathon that's uh, released this weekend in um, uh, Miami. Um, and, you know, this is a, a very straightforward setup. You know, I, I use Eventbrite because um, it's a, you know, most, People tend to, to use some kind of a online uh, uh, distribution method for you know, announcing events. Um, we also do replicate this on Facebook events as well. Uh, but you can clearly, you know, clearly see here it shows the schedule. Um, okay, outline. Alex, maybe I also want you, Alex, I also maybe address oh. just all. What I think is really great that you do is the, all the different types of the classifications of attendees you do here, where oh really right, right welcome right. welcome in the community of designers, marketing, idea for people, all the above. Yeah, so 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 one of the big things with hackathons is that we want to – it's it's a, a hackathon at its core is really about playing with stuff, right? That That's what you remember when you as a kid, how did you learn? Well, you know, you picked up the block, the square block, and see if it went into the round hole, right? And if that peg didn't fit, well, then, you know, you go try something else and try to find that hole that fits. So um, that's where, you know, with, with – uh, uh, the reason why we have all these different distinctions of the different classifications of types of people that can come is we're trying to invite as many people to come to the hackathon uh, because it takes different types of personalities and different types of skill sets to really get an application off the ground. Um, and, and that's the same way that we approach it. You know, when you come to a hackathon, at the hackathon itself, um, uh, we don't interfere with the networking and the team formation. We really let the developers and the attendees form their own teams because they themselves, at the end of the day, are going to know who they work well with and who they don't. Um, you know, but, but we set it up by inviting as many people as we can. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, as you, you know, you can see here, the, the schedule is something else that's, that's pretty critical uh, to making sure that people understand uh, what time, you know, uh, certain things are going to happen, as well as the challenges uh, to then drive the developer interaction. Um, you know, so as you consider your own hackathons, um, what the, one of the best ways that we found out in setting it up, uh, you know, is that developers are very, um, uh, they've been, they, they understand what challenges are. And so that's what we've done here. You can see on, on the Eventbrite, uh, we've posted different types of challenges with different dollar amounts. And so once the developers see that, then they will go and build towards that end goal, right? So if you say uh, 500 bucks for the best, you know, uh, AT&T SMS API, then that's what developers will build. If you say $1,000 for the best AT&T call management control API application, they will build that. Um, and so that's pretty much just these, like, events on the ground and uh, you can see clearly that we have a lot of prizes um you know incentivizing different platforms different uh uh apis um and then the other key part as we kind of scroll down further here are the uh uh speaker names and bat bios um is as, as the uh uh the other piece that's interesting to developers is they want to know who they're going to be interfacing with or who they have the potential to talk to at these events. Um, and having a lineup of not only seasoned uh, developers, but also, you know, potentially influential people uh, makes a huge difference. Um, another aspect is also Sensei. This is something that we strive to have at all of our events, our, our uh, technical on-site help. 
makes a huge difference. Um, you know, as, as you're as you're, you're taking that square peg and you're trying to find that hole that matches that. If you can't find it and you need help, it, it, there's nothing more frustrating than not being able to find that. That you know, find what you want to build. You know, be able to build what you want to build, and uh, and that's why we have senseis on the ground is uh, because they can help the attendees build the applications they're looking to build, and they can get farther faster. Uh, and, and, you know, and that just ties into a much better experience. And lastly, I just want to mention, I have put all the, you know, show how you, you bring, <clears throat> what's great with AT&T is they bring together this large community of, of various API providers, uh, developer tools, um, legal services for mobile app developers, and bring that all together in these hackathons, um, I think is really also helpful to make those mobile app developers feel like, you know, hey, we're going to get help here. Um, you know, these companies aren't just here to sell us stuff, they're here to help us. And the sponsors are really uh, yeah. a really good, good ecosystem. Yeah, I actually gave her. That's a great point. There is that that the way that I approach that we approach hackathons as well as you know the other developer focused events is that it's a developer focused event. Never lose sight of that aspect as you are uh, crafting your event as well as the marketing content that goes into it. You know, if you're in this to just sell the API, which, which is not, there's nothing wrong with that per se, but, but you need to really put the developer first in this case, um, as opposed to just trying to blindly sell them something. Uh, and that really makes a difference in, in crafting an event where you know, not only does the developer feel at home, but then they're, they're willing to come back to you. And it's, it's really forging that, it's, it's forging a relationship at the end of the day. And, and, that, and that's what these hackathons do is they, they forge, they create, and it's an awesome engagement platform, but it really builds relationships at the end of the day. And and we're really starting to see the you know the the benefits of this strategy. Um, if you look at like we we launched a um, a smaller uh, 200 300 person uh, technical event in San Francisco um, earlier this year. Uh, it's called Dev Lab, and you know, we, we drew out about 250 some odd participants, and it was because of hackathons that we were able to draw out um, that many people. Um, and you know, and moving forward into the next developer summit, we're seeing the same type of effect uh, that hackathons, you know, are driving increased visibility of our program on a whole uh, to into areas that we haven't seen before. Right. So, uh, one clear example: if you if Google. Google the term, a uh, couple of words, 11-year-old uh, hackathon. And you will see that we, you know, the, the hackathon that we ran uh, in Los Angeles is plastered all, I mean, like, that it's, it, it's in so many different uh, online magazines, and blogs, and whatnot. It's just incredible, the amount of media pickup that, that we got from that one event. Um, right, and I, I think as, as to the mobile app developer themselves, that's so key to know that, hey, if I use these APIs, I could end up on the cover of, of the newspaper tomorrow. I could exactly. be on the news tomorrow because these APIs are a big deal. This platform, they're they're you know they're new, and if I do something interesting, they you know this could be a big opportunity for my career, for my mobile app development skills, and get me out there as well as a developer. Exactly. Uh, yeah, the developer definitely sees uh, uh, benefit for coming to the events because they they see that they can get into all these different publication channels. And at the same time, this is also where, you know, you know, going back to the point of this particular uh, section is, you know, sponsoring hackathons is that, um, uh, you know, from a partner standpoint, if you want to work with AT&T on these hackathons, it's very, it's easy to see the value because not only do I introduce you to our other high value partners, but I also introduce you to developers that could build products for you, that could build products for your partners, or that, you know, I can introduce you to internal ATT uh, resources that need products built, and then and it's 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 a it's a it's it's an awesome entanglement of all sorts of different interests coming to play all at once, um, but that really entangle well um, with multiple benefits. Um, so, hey, Alex, one of 
One quick thing, I think uh, we did have a question come through, and maybe you can just address it as a topic here, just about, and I know <laughs> yeah, we've we've worked a lot together on these kinds of issues, is, is kind of the legal aspect of these hackathons. Um, oh. I know at and has a great approach to it. I know that, you know, sometimes an employee, as an employee for your company, you go to hackathon, who owns your work, um, who owns what happens at the hackathons. Maybe you can address kind of some of the legal aspects here as well to make sure, and in, just in light of what this means to the developer themselves. And, and Absolutely. How they so, so the, uh, okay, so, so this, so again, this is 100% developer focused. The developers own the code. Uh, that that come out of these these events, um, and that's the way that we we've, we've written the uh, the legal documentation. Um, the and that that's one really critical thing to focus on is that I I would not have watched this event if it was any other way. Like you could imagine me walking into a room like, yeah, welcome to AT and T's hackathon. We now own all your code. I <laughs> like I probably get like lynched right there, um, <laughs> and so. You know, it's it's again, again. This is 100% developer focused. Um, the developers need to own the code. If you're going to run a hackathon where that doesn't happen, don't run the hackathon. I just right. don't do it. I like it's it's it, it'll be really bad for your brand. Um, and I, I um, you know, just uh, uh, Google egregious legal terms hackathon, and uh, you'll come <laughs> across multiple listings. And there's one run here in Seattle. Uh, by a local newspaper, um, they did offer up uh, quite a bit of money, you know, ten grand, but they didn't write the terms in such a friendly way, um, you know, very just legally restricting, um, and that's not what a developer right. wants. Because developer knows that they can they can go and develop something, and they come across a decent idea, they they want to know that they can keep retain the rights to that to that IP. Right, and as I think it's even really it tells a lot that you have uh, at this weekend hackathon in Miami. S and M, which is a law firm there, is a big sponsor um, because, you know, I, um, you know, a question came through here in the chat just about kind of, oh, you know, hey, who owns? Am I allowed to participate? You know, oh, what if somebody? You know, you know, the other thing is like, what if somebody? You know, what if my second cousin works at AT and T? Am I now ineligible for prizes? And and all these things come up. And and I think uh, I know myself personally. I've <laughs> I've dealt with it. Um, and I think you know, as a developer. You're always kind of, um, you know, dealing with legal issues because it's code, it's intellectual property, and mm -hmm. and that's uh, and as the uh, API publisher, it's just important to show, you know, the developers like, hey, we're here to help support you. Um, you know, the law is the law sometimes, and, and it's not always what we want it to be, uh, but uh, you know, by showing with AT&T partnering here with SNM, for example, for the hackathon, you know, it just shows that hey, there's these issues are out there, and it's not. It's not always that simple, and um, not always what we want it to be. But um, but I think the way AT&T's approach has been a great approach, and they're doing the best they can to facilitate um, the ecosystem of mobile app developers. So, and so hey, Matt, Alex, hey, if you can uh, just kind of, you know, I think maybe just touch on here some, uh, <clears throat> you know, I think you kind of covered a lot of this, uh, but maybe just mention. Uh, what at and is doing for your hackathon circuit. Um, and, and just so everyone knows, you know, we start with that slide uh, that showed, you know, at and is doing a lot of hackathons. And here you can see um, they did almost one a week here in the past year uh, <laughs> and uh, really driving adoption of APIs and as well as other companies as well. Um, so that's just kind of 2012 schedule. Um, what are some of your goals for hackathons for the next, for the coming year? And, and as far as bringing on other sponsors, other API publishers on board. Yeah, um, you know, so 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 right now we're on track for 30 hackathons uh, for 2013, um, including CES, which is on January 5th, uh, and South by Southwest in March. Uh, those are two big ones, and then uh, we're in discussions for MWC Mobile World Congress in Barcelona as well. Um, but. Uh, you know, it's just increasing the number of hackathons. We also have an increased focus on um, social good hackathons, where you know we. Uh, I, I've I, one of my you know personal goals is really just that there's a lot of app, these hackathons drive a lot of application development. It's great, but you know one of the issues during these events is that you see a lot of the code kind of just flushed away. Um, 
you know, because it was it was an opportunity. It was, it was a great opportunity for the developer to to take a look at the APIs and play with them, as well as new technologies. But then at the end of the day, the code isn't really put towards uh, any specific use. And so, um, you know, with AT and T's wide investment in, in a number of nonprofits, that's where we you know, began working with them to solicit, you know, application needs that the nonprofits have. And so we've been inviting them out to these events to pitch their their needs, and then you know, ATT posts a couple thousand dollars for a surprise against um, that application requirement. And most of these applications, you know, when it, uh, addressing the question probably that's popping up in your mind about IP, again, these applications are not anything too complicated. You know, you're talking about like um, RSS feed applications, uh, email applications of some sort. Um, it's, just, it's just pushing information to their constituents that are involved in um, uh, the nonprofit. Um, yeah, I think, and so most I think of the takeaway. Uh, I was going to say a takeaway there is that you know the developers want to feel good about what they're building as well, and that's kind of important for the API publisher to know that hey, my content yeah. is going to you know developers are going to use our content, our APIs, and they're going to tell their friends. Uh, and then you know you mentioned throwaway code. It, it's often a problem, but I often hear stories. Well, they they you know the developer went, they tested out say for example an AT and T API at a hackathon threw away the app they built there, but two months later they're at, they're at their day job and suddenly they have a same, similar need for that same API and guess which API they have experience with, uh, the one they use at the hackathon. Exactly, and that, that ties into to a larger, you know, I'm sure that, that there's a question of like demographic, like who shows up at these hackathons and whatnot. Um, and uh, we, we'll, we'll, you I'm sure uh, we'll, we'll be publishing more results of our hackathons, so you'll have uh, higher level statistics you can look at, um, you know, in terms of like who comes to the actual hackathon. But Gaber's point is exactly right that um, a wide swath, of, you know, so not only is the, these hackathons target garage developers as well as enterprise developers, and we see a very wide diversity of developers flow through these hackathons, um, and it's absolutely, you know, that 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 these events drive that curiosity, the developer curiosity of like, gee, what does this API do? And I, they know that they can come to the event, play with the API, get help in implementing the API, and they're like, okay, great, now I've leveled up, I can add that tool to my toolkit for a later time. And then, you know, as they go back to their day jobs and they encounter a need for call management, for billing, for SMS, uh, workflow management, whatever it may be, and then they're like, "Oh yeah, you know, I, I remember Layer Seven had these APIs. Let me go, let me go take a look at that again." Uh, and and that—that's really, you know, driving that, that uh, driving the API adoption within the marketplace. Um, all right, so I guess uh, okay, wrap well, yeah, this so up. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, that was that was fantastic, Alex. And you know, we brought in a uh, really lucky here to have Alex join us because AT and T has built a very successful hackathon program with such a strong focus on APIs and uh, they've built a great community of developers and you know they're they've been really welcoming to many other API publishers to come in be a sponsor offer a prize for usage of their API um, I've, I've been to many many myself and have seen just so many different APIs that get launched often here out at these hackathons with AT&T and uh, and that's kind of why we want to make sure we um, you know, let you know everyone on the call. That I think AT and T is pretty open to um, you know taking on new sponsors at any time, and uh, you can do one hackathon, you can do ten with them, uh, and, and get your APIs out there um, and promoted through AT and T, and really use these hackathons as a testing bed, um, as Alex mentioned, uh, for you know banging on those APIs, checking if the the round peg fits in the square hole or not, and then learning from the developers quickly. Um, through hackathons as a way to get to those mobile app developers. So, okay, Alex. So I'm going to kind of just jump next, and, and feel free, Alex, to stay on here. And I, I think you may have some more <clears throat> things to say here. Uh, I just the next thing I want to cover was running online uh, developer uh, challenges, uh, and and how those can be kind of the next step beyond the hackathon. Uh, and and so, you know, there's often sometimes. We have, you know, uh, hackathons are obviously a limited time frame, and we talked here about throwaway code. And the question I often get from uh, Layer 7 customers especially is, oh, well, what's going to happen to this hackathon? Is my app just going to be built for a prize and is going to be thrown away? Um, so another option here, and I think AT&T has done some of these, and I know 
Samsung, and I'll show some examples here, have done these long, longer term online <coughs> competitions. Uh, so you have more, you know, more time enables the developers to build more. And <coughs> you saw, like, oh, you saw that the AT&T sample hackathon, they offer these prizes for, hey, you know, just integrate our API, have a working app, have working code, and you'll qualify for this prize. But what I see in online challenges <coughs> is more stringent requirements. Uh, something like, oh, you have to have it in the App Store submission. And I know, you know, Alex and I have seen it, AT&T hackathons often, developers do get them in the Android App Store in that two-day time frame uh, because it's pretty quick. It's just one or two hours to get that um, app live in the, the App Store. Uh, and, and so that could be a requirement. Uh, for uh, a mobile app online competition. And then you can also require that mul multiple platforms are built for. That you need to have an iOS and Android version of this app to qualify for that prize. Um, so, you know, and then, you know, location, obviously online challenges can be national uh, or even international. Uh, and, and often these hackathons, that's why <laughs> I think Alex Don and his team have racked up more frequent flyer miles than many other people in the country because they've been traveling like crazy um, to get local, uh, which is fantastic. And then, but then often these online challenges let you just do it virtually. And, uh, and then also in the offline aspect, <clears throat> you're, sometimes we meet people in person, we fail to connect on LinkedIn, we fail to connect on the social media. Um, the online challenges can really drive that kind of, hey, you know, get people connected that way. And I just want to mention um, that Lairstone has a partnership with Challenge Post to help um, drive these kinds of online challenges. Challenge Post is a great platform, although there are others out there. Um, and, and I don't know if there's other ones even out there. And I, I just want to mention a couple use cases here. Uh, this is a really famous online uh, app competition. It was done by Netflix. It was a $1 million grand prize. Um, their goal really was mobile apps, but the prize was to write the best uh, um, automated way to advise users what they may also like for movies. Um, there's a big contest, a big cash prize is done online over time uh, to generate these kinds of results that they wanted for their APIs. Uh, Evernote just did one recently here. They used Challenge Post as their platform. Um, it was purely app focused. So, you know, getting the next generation of memorable apps built using Evernote's APIs, they offered over 100,000 in prizes. So that was just another one, as you can see down below here, they did have a winner's gallery um, that they promote those apps that were built as, as well after the fact. And that's pretty much um, the end of our webinar. I want to make sure I left some time here uh, for before the top of the hour, a few more minutes here for uh, any questions here that came through. Um, and uh, so let's see. We've got a few questions coming through here. I, I, I'm so just, questions? Uh, yeah, I, I see Eric's question. Um, I, I don't have a count on that right now. I can go back and uh, hunt that information down and get back to Eric. Okay, okay. I know that you know we do see a lot, and uh, you know one thing I'll even point out here for Alex and AT&T's APIs, like um, things like geolocation. I know, and often some, sometimes the, the apps that get built in the hackathon, as Alex described, may not, they may be throwaway. However, the, the developer learned about the AT&T location API. So you can actually query the AT&T API and find out the location of a device. Uh, and I as an app developer know that anytime I built an app using GPS, develop, uh, the, the consumers of the, my app hate it because it, it sucks down the battery life and is using GPS all the time. It, you know, AT&T as well as the other carriers offer these carrier APIs that don't take any battery life off the phone. Often as a developer though, you're accessing these APIs through aggregators after the fact. But if I hadn't gone to AT&T hackathons, I would have had no idea that I, these types of, that this technology even existed. Um, and so there's often kind of an abstraction layer of um, which, uh, which different apps get built. Um, and so it's kind of a, you know, these doing these hackathons, getting your APIs out there is kind of a the first step to doing the promotion for them and getting the, the APIs out there. Yeah, jumping yeah. in here really quickly, the um, and also yeah. just you know, answering Eric's uh, question, which was actually uh, what I was going to talk about next. Um, uh, 
you know, so, so there, there definitely are successes that come out of these hackathons. Um, and and it's, it's really measured, the way to look at hackathons is, is more from a venture capital investment uh, angle where, you know, you're, you're, you're placing down bets um, and 10% uh, or less are going to come through. Um, and so uh, of all the different projects that are, you know, uh, have been attempted, I think there's like, so, what is this, like 300 or 500 some odd teams that have actually been formed. Um, I believe the current count is at 14 applications that have made it to market. Um, and uh, I have to go back, actually, it's, it's just about that time to go back and double check to see, I have to, ping, I have to email all the previous participants of the hackathon to see who's made it to market. Um, the the no, most notable one um, that I know of that comes to top of mind is um, uh, Monkey Write. So if you look up monkey as in like elephant monkey uh, and then write as in read and write, uh, you'll see the um, uh, Android app that was written. Um, and it was made at one of our first hackathons with HTC where they were showing off their um, uh, pen, the digital pen that was pressure sensitive. And so one of the participants thought that that would make a great um, uh, tool to teach Chinese calligraphy. and you know, clearly she went on to win our hackathon, and then she actually took the same app, you know, added additional features that other hackathons kept continuing to win them, and uh, her downloads are, I think, I believe in the 50,000 range right now. Um, oh. And uh, another two, uh, you know, another two of them, so one of them uh, was read, was called Read With Me, which is an excellent um, kind of a teaching tool for kids to, to learn to read. Um, and then another one that I'm actually, I'm actually personally really excited for this one is, is um, uh, it's an application that came out of our new, recent New York hackathon with BMW on uh, sustainability. And the application essentially enables people to um, tell the world about what vegetables that they've got in their backyard. Um, and, and the hope there is that, you know, they can, this application can then begin addressing micro farming uh, on, on a certain level, um, you know, that for those of us that, that are lucky enough to own houses or maybe unlucky in some senses of having to mow the lawn every weekend, but, um, uh, you've got, you've got, you know, if you've got space to be able to, to plant some, uh, vegetables or whatnot. And so you can just imagine, you know, if, if we could go down that path, you could have fresh vegetables, um, and that the, the, uh, there could be an entire ecosystem that can be set up. And that's what, uh, this particular application addresses is, is uh, Trying to set up that ecosystem. Yeah. Um, and, and Alex, I want because I, I think uh, the uh, the gentleman here asked a follow up question. Just wanted to, he he asked if if we're able to measure the number of new apps and or developer registrations from each type of activity. And I think definitely yes. I know you. I know I've seen from you, Alex, uh, some detailed statistics on you know attendees, apps built, API calls made, a, you know, registrations for the developer portal. And I know that's something we definitely have um, that Layer 7 provides as part of our API portal that our customers use is, you know, all these kinds of measurement uh, aspects because, you know, if you're not, if you're not, you're, you're not marketing if you're not measuring. What's that? There's a quote <laughs> like that. Um, and it's definitely, obviously, you know, that's kind of comes back to treating your API like a brand, like a product. And you're going to do all sorts of, of marketing activities for your API. Uh, sometimes it's called evangelism, uh, but it's very technical marketing, uh, which would be a proper way to look at it. And, and that is definitely something I'm, I'm often beholden to. I'm, I know Alex Don is at AT&T providing that, that data back and, and showing results and, and measuring it uh, to know what, what works, what doesn't, what kind of quality are we getting here. Uh, and then also, you know, there is this, there is often this soft, kind of soft side to it, which is you know, developers learn about the API and learn it exists, then they can bring it back to their day job, and suddenly, you know, some big company is now consuming your API that you'd never expected them to. Um, and so that's yeah. Kind of, and, let's, go ahead. And, and, and an additional um, benefit of this, you know, so, so in addition to the hard numbers of, you know, the number of API calls and apps and development and all that stuff, um, Something else that's in, uh, that's almost intangible to a certain degree is Gaber and my ability to be able to bring developers to your doorstep at a moment's notice. Um, 
and this is actually a challenge to those of you that are on the call, is if you have APIs, you know, if, you, if you're thinking about having, you know, coming out with APIs or, you know, you have APIs out there, um, I, I, I know this, this challenge is simple. Bring 20 developers to a location tomorrow. And if How do you, you do can't it? do that, if you, if you can't do that, you don't have a vibrant developer ecosystem. But that's something right. that, that, that we, like Gabriel and I, have set up, essentially, is that, and that's, that's my value to AT&T, is that on a drop of a dime, I can get 20 developers in almost any city to come out for yeah. an event. And yeah. so that, that, that in and of itself has a lot of value because uh, as, you know, AT&T, my, my, my technical guys are compensated because they're technical. That's, that's what we pay them for is to, to, to build the APIs. They're not there to build the relationships, to uh, sustain them and maintain them and all that stuff. That's what Gaber and I are there for. Um, right. And, um, and, that, it, and, and that's what we do. Yeah, I want to segue that, Alex, to a, we had one last question here. I just want to make sure we get to. Uh, the question was, is there a community where, you know, we can see all the resources for app, apps and APIs out there? And I think kind of like on what Alex is saying there is that that's what we help developers know. And when we're at the hackathons and they say, hey, where can we find an API that does this? Or, hey, what, you know, is there, do you know any, any uh, frameworks that, are, are good for, you know, UI for, that look just like native iOS but work with PhoneGap. Um, and, and those kind of things. And, and yes, you know, uh, Sachin will um, shoot you an email after. Um, but that's kind of what, what Alex, Don, and I can bring, you know, bring and help is that, hey, we know that, there, hey, there's a site programmable web. It's a, list, a resource for all sorts of other APIs. Um, whether you're the API publisher, we help you get listed in there uh, and, and help, you know, promote your API there through there properly. Uh, whether it's getting integrated into all these different mobile app development tools like Tigzy and AppCelerator uh, as well. Um, those are the kinds of um, things we do. And, and the question here is, is there a community where you can see all the resources for app development? And, and then, you know, the community is the hackathon community, I really think. Um, that's where, you know, I, often I go and, and Alex goes, and that's where developers go to learn about new tools out there, new resources. Um, new APIs, new app, new app development tools, um, and that's kind of part of this whole uh, ecosystem that's growing. Yes, yes. Right. Actually, this is something I'm really passionate about, which is you know, I, I'm seeing a change in the way that, that people, you know, like you, we, you, Gabriel, like our, our particular generation, especially developers, we, we don't, we're trained to just go play with the technology, go play with whatever it is that we want to learn, and we're social by nature, and that's the way that I see the learning the learning habits changing. Is is that um, you look at Meetup.com? Part of the reason why like Meetup.com is is gaining in popularity is because people are realizing that they have to go learn themselves, and that's the beauty of the hackathon community as well, where where the developers are just going, they're going to find um, how do I say this correctly? They're they are actively seeking out the knowledge. Uh, and there's the social aspect of learning that that is becoming very important, um, and that's part of the reason for success for for these for hackathons in general. Definitely, definitely. So, okay, well, uh, Mr. Don, thank you. I think uh, we hit the top of the hour here, um, and uh, I think it was a fantastic presentation. Thank you very much for uh, joining uh, your. Expertise and experience here are uh, invaluable, definitely, and, and what you've accomplished with the uh, AT&T Hackathon program and, and sponsoring and promoting their APIs has been uh, very impressive. So um, we're very fortunate for you to have for you to join us today. So thank you, Alex. Thanks for having me. So uh, so anyways, just uh, you, you can see our contact info here. Uh, if you do have any other follow-up questions, please feel free to send us tweets or, of course, find us um, through our websites. Um, Alex is mainly at developer.att.com or I'm at layer7.com. And um, we, we look forward to continuing to uh, help finding really cool and new APIs and, and working with developers to get them uh, integrated into their mobile apps. So thank you, everyone, for joining. And uh, we'll see you next time on the Layer 7 webinar. Thank you.